So welcome to all of you. Keep thinking, yeah? Well, originally I found it in English, yeah? but it says something like that, yeah? All the philosophical, economical, and political systems which are governing the human beings, yeah? Well, all agree on one point, yeah? They are made to fool the people, yeah? yeah? And uh, it's, I, I, I'm very, well, when I saw that for the first time, yeah, 30 years ago, I was shocked. I say, well, they exaggerate, but now I'm fully convinced that they are right. So, well, last, last time, yeah, you had a lesson, yeah, with uh, Olivier Wertz, uh, Ludovic Delcham, and Maxime de Vogel, yeah? So, if you have any problem or question with regard to how to reduce the data, yeah, they are ready to to, to answer your questions, yeah? So you may go to them, yeah? But it will be very important, yeah, to, to master the data reduction problem because when you will have to observe, yeah, with a telescope, you'll get data and you will confront it, yeah, to, 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 to that problem. Okay, now, does it work? Yeah, just some reminders about what we, we have seen uh, two weeks ago, yeah? First, you remember that the angular radius of a star is a linear radius divided by the distance to that star. And we have seen that, well, here, something is missing. Well, here is, a, well, some formula are missing. I don't know why, yeah? But uh, the temperature, effective temperature, yeah? We have seen, yeah? could be derived from the observation of the observed flux of the star and from the angular radius, yeah? Then a concept that we have seen is a representation, complex representation of the electromagnetic field as a function of the time variable and space variable. Then we have seen that, well, if you were considering a quasi-monochromatic light, so not purely monochromatic light, but quasi-monochromatic light. It was possible to let two beams interfering, yeah? As long as uh, <coughs> the difference in the arrival times, yeah, would be smaller than the coherence time, and the coherence time was the inverse of the bandwidth, yeah, expressed in frequency. Or, well, I see that all my, some symbols don't, don't show up. I, I don't know why, it doesn't matter. Uh, well, this represents, in fact, the coherence length. So if we are thinking in terms of space variables, yeah, uh, <coughs> the two beams would interfere in quasi-monochromatic light if the difference in optical path length would be smaller than yeah, the coherence length, which is given by the square of the wavelengths divided by the bandwidth expressed here yeah, in the wavelengths. Uh, then we, we've seen yeah, what was, uh, well, the intensity yeah, was defined as being, uh, in fact, the square of the amplitude of the electromagnetic field. Okay, after, we've seen that if we were considering monochromatic light, and we're making the experiment with the two holes of Young. You remember that experiment, yeah? And if you were looking at a so, so source of light, well, the fringes would disappear, yeah? If the angular width of the source, yeah? Was bigger or about equal to the wavelengths divided by twice the baseline between the two holes. Now, in quasi-monochromatic light, what we have seen is that <coughs> if you were looking at the light distribution in the observer screen at a given point, the expression was given by what is shown here. So I and I are the two intensity of light that you would receive from the two holes yeah, if there were no interference. But given the fact that there are additional interferences here, yeah, we have to take into account this expression, where this represents the complex degree of mutual co coherence of the light. Yeah. Now, uh, tau is a 
difference in the arrival times and between the two beams, nu is a frequency. Well, I remember, I remind you yeah, another expression yeah, for the complex degree of mutual coherence, where V represents yeah, the, the expression of the electromagnetic field due to the whole one and the other one to the whole two. And then we've seen that when we were observing yeah, the fringes yeah, produced by a small interferometer, the contrast, yeah, which is also called the visibility, is just given by the modulus yeah, of the complex degree of mutual coherence. Then I, I told you last time yeah, that we would make some experiments this time, yeah? And so it's what we are going to do now, yeah? So I'm going to distribute some material to make two, two experiments. So you will receive a piece of cartoon like that. Then what you do, yeah, you just fold it in two pieces. Where you take this tool, yeah, and just make two holes, yeah, on both sides, yeah. So the first hole, yeah, will be to set uh, a piece of aluminium. So I will give you pieces of aluminium, yeah, and a needle, and you will try to make a hole as circular as possible, and if possible with a size of about half a millimeter, yeah. Okay, so let's do that. Then I will just install a source of light here. Well, maybe further away, I, I try to, to set the light there. And then with your, let's say, single pupil telescope, yeah, you will look at the source of light and you should see very, very clearly yeah, the airy disk pattern, yeah. So which angular size I remember, you remember is 2.44, times the wavelength divided by the size of the hole, yeah? So smaller is the hole, yeah, better it is, yeah? So if, if you make a quarter of a millimeter, it's even better. The hole will be bigger. It will be better, well, easier to see. Try to make two holes, yeah? Circular ones, half a millimeter inside, separated by one millimeter, okay? So, You remember we did in the past, yeah? First we we took the experiment of the of the young young well young with the two holes, took a monochromatic source of light, which was located very far away. Then we had a plane wave, and then well we knew that in the observer screen we would observe yeah fringes uh, fully bright and fully dark, yeah, yeah. Then we say, well, and if we use a monochromatic light, what shall we get? And then we, we, we saw that in that case, we would also get fringes, yeah? But uh, <clears throat> with a visibility which would not be equal to one, yeah? But somewhere between zero and one. Okay. But still, it's for two holes, yeah? Yeah, so in the experiment, we still consider two holes. And, and we found that the visibility yeah, would essentially depend on the correlations yeah, between the electric fields and the two points. Yeah? Then I told you, in fact, the complex degree of mutual coherence yeah, is related yeah, to the signature of the structure of the source. Yeah? Yeah? And it's what we are going to, to see now. So l let's assume that <coughs> we, we have here a source with a finite extent, yeah? And that, well, what you see here, yeah, is a projection of the, of the source of light on the plane of the sky, yeah? So it's what, what you see. And so, well, I just consider that it's made of uh, infinitesimally small elements, yeah? With an area that I call DSI. And that the total surface that you see projected on the, on the, on the sky is S, yeah? So summation of all those small elements. Now, what I'm wondering, in that case, yeah, what will be the value of uh, the intensity in the observer screen? And well, we, we, we know what, what it is, yeah? Where the intensity is equal to 2i times 1 plus, 
So here it was the modulus of the complex degree of mutual coherence for tau, tau equals zero times the cosine. Here there is a small uh, well, parameter accounting for a phase shift. It means that when you're observing the fringes, well, the fringes could be slightly to the right or slightly to the left. That's not important. And then <coughs> we get this factor where tau represents the time difference between the arrivals yeah, of the two beams, so of the two beams at Q, and where nu is a frequency of the monochromatic light or quasi-monochromatic light, the central, wave, central frequency. Okay, now, well, I know that the expression you know, of, of this quantity is given by the time average yeah, of the electric field observed yeah, for the whole one in this screen times the electric field observed in the second hole divided by high. Now, V1 and V2 yeah, can also be represented yeah, as a summation on all the smaller surface elements yeah, of the electric fields emitted by each of them. Yeah? So it's just a summation from I equal 1 to N. And I do the same for the other one. Now well, what we do, we replace this expression in, in the previous one and we distribute. And then we find the, for the complex degree of mutual coherence that it is equal to the summation for i equal 1 to n, and you see here vi1 conjugate times v, vi2. So this is for the same source element, yeah? And after I have a summation for i different of j, yeah? Okay? Well, here, of course, yeah, you never have i equal to j, yeah, i equal to j is here. So here it means that you are looking yeah, at the co coherence between two small elements which are independent on, of each other, yeah. It means that on the average, yeah, this quantity will be equal to zero because there is no coherence of light, yeah. So this is zero, it goes away, so what remains is just this quantity. Now, what are the expressions here yeah, for VI1 and VI2? Well, you remember last time, we've seen that, well, <coughs> there is a, a real amplitude. Now, what is a real amplitude? Well, it's here, the <coughs> ampli amplitude evaluated yeah, on the surface element I, but not at the time T, but at the time T minus the propagation time from i to the whole number one. Coucou, ton attention, hein? oui. Okay, so here we are taking into account yeah, the fact that the light takes some time yeah, to come from the source element i to the whole number one. Now, well, we just divide yeah, by r i one because you remember the intensity, yeah? is uh, proportional to the square of the real amplitude. And of course, you have a dilution yeah, due, due to geometry yeah, of the light. Well, farther away is the source, yeah, fainter it will be. So this accounts for dilution, geometric dilution. Yeah. Now after, you remember, we have to multiply by a complex exponent, exponential, yeah, where we see again yeah, the variable t, and now well, here is uh, the time delay, of course, yeah? And the same for the second one. So now we have to multiply this one, this one conjugate by that one. So if I do that, what I will obtain, yeah? I will obtain, so I, I'm just evaluating uh, this quantity between bracket, yeah? So it's a time average. So I just say, okay, the average of vi, I1 star T times VI2 T is equal to, here I say, well, it's AI 
time t minus r i1 divided by c conjugate time a i times t minus r i2 divided by c I'm just looking if it's okay so this one I don't need everything divided by r i1 times r i2 like this and then I just multiply when I take the conjugate complex of this quantity times this one I see that the time variable will go away so it will be minus I two P nu multiplied by R I one minus R I two like this divided by well here just divided by C like this. Okay? Now <coughs> well you see now I shall assume yeah, that so this represents yeah, the real amplitude yeah, of the front waves arriving to you, but you remember that the, the front waves which arrive to you yeah, is something like that. There is a frequency in you, but the amplitude yeah, is modulated. Yeah? It's being modulated because of the beating phenomenon, like that. Yeah? So the amplitude, yeah. And if I assume yeah, that the difference in the arrival time between this one and that one is smaller than the coherence time, so if I assume yeah, that R I1 divided by C minus R I2 divided by C is much smaller than the coherence time, which is equal to 1 over delta nu. Well, in that case, it means that well, the amplitude of the first one, which is uh, this one, is somewhere here, and the amplitude of the second one is somewhere there, yeah? Because the co coherence time, tau, yeah, is this length of time, yeah? So if I assume that the time delay difference yeah, is much smaller than the coherence time, I may assume that the two amplitudes are nearly the same. Which means that here, what I can do, I take this away, and I take the module of this square, okay? Now here, if you divide yeah, by Ri1 times Ri2, I can as well say, well, just take the square of that, yeah? Because it doesn't make any difference, yeah? It's maybe, uh, okay, 100 light years, yeah? in one case and 100 light years plus one millimeter in the second case, yeah? So it doesn't make any difference when you make the ratio of the two, okay? And this is what you, 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 you see here, more or less, yeah? Now we have to sum, to sum up, yeah? On all the small surface element. Now you see this quantity so the, the module square of the amplitude, yeah, well, <clears throat> due to the source element I, well, is simply the intensity of that source element times the projection of the surface element on the, on the sky. Okay, this is okay. Well, now maybe uh, <clears throat> I've written the, the condition in a different way. So I've, I've written here that R I1 minus R Y2 you agree is smaller or equal to c times tau, which is equal to c over delta nu. Oh, this is c, sorry. And last time we've seen that c over delta nu yeah, is nothing else than lambda square over delta lambda, which is a co coherence length. Yeah? So either you may think in terms of a coherence time or in terms of coherence length. 
Okay, so now I, I repeat, this quantity, we shall replace it here yeah, by the intensity due to the surface element S, Si, times the projection of that source, the surface element on the sky. So it's what you see here. So this is simply equal to that. And now, well, what we should do, I'm just come back, no. So we replace this here yeah, by the intensity uh, ISDS. Then we have to sum up here yeah, on all the surface elements. It means that, well, we just have to make a double integration yeah, over the <coughs> angular coordinates. So let's go here. So you see gamma 1 to 0 is equal to int integration of IS yeah, times <coughs> that quantity. So here before we had, uh, I think it was nu over C, yeah? but lambda is equal to C over nu. Yeah? So therefore, you see it like that. And the result that uh, we have derived here is known as the theorem of Zernike van Sitter. Yeah? So I should just write down the expression here. The complex degree of mutual coherence yeah, is simply equal yeah, to double integration okay, of I over all the source element. Now we have the imaginary exponential. R2 minus R1. So it was times nu over C. So this is just uh, divided by lambda, like that. After I integrate over all the small surface element. And we have to divide yeah, that by the total intensity I. And still, I have to divide this by R1, R2. So this is known as the theorem of Zernike van Sittert. And uh, in that form, it's not very useful, yeah, but we shall make now some approximation to apply this theorem. And so here it comes. Yeah? So what is represented here yeah, is one of those source, small source elements, yeah? SI, DSI. Yeah? So which is projected on, a, on the sky, on the plane of the sky. And you see I have adopted yeah, coordinate systems, which is such that this point yeah, is at coordinate 0, 0, 0. This one, yeah. So everything what you see projected on the plane of the sky yeah, is at a distance z prime, yeah, which is the same for all the source elements, since it's a projection. Now, to locate in, in, in the perpendicular plane yeah, to that direction, the source element, where I need the coordinate x prime, y prime. Well, here what I have represented are the two holes. Yeah? First hole, second hole. So both of them have a z coordinate equal to 0. And we have decided yeah, to allocate the coordinate 0, 0 yeah, to the second hole and coordinate x, y to the first hole. Now, what we need to know, what we need to calculate yeah, is R2 minus R1. So what's the difference yeah, between this distance and that distance, yeah, OK? And to get that result, yeah, we will proceed uh, just uh, in a similar fashion as last time yeah, in the experiment of the two holes of Young. Yeah? So, You agree that R2 minus R1 is equal yeah, to P2i minus P1i. Like this. So just say, okay, it's P2i yeah, is the square root of. So the distance between uh, this hole and the surface element DSi is just x prime square plus y prime square plus z prime square, yeah? So easy.
Now, we subtract the other distance, and here it's a bit different. We just have to take x minus x prime square plus y minus y prime square plus z prime square. So as last time, what I do here, yeah, I just put uh, z prime in parentheses. So I just say, okay, this is equal to z prime multiplied by square root of 1 plus x prime square plus y prime square divided by z prime square minus square root of 1 plus x minus x prime square plus like that. Agree? Now here <coughs> we assume of course that the distance z prime is much much bigger well these are many light years yeah compared to the size of the source it means x prime y prime yeah and we also assume that the distance is much bigger than the separation between the two holes, yeah? which can be, well, maximum some hundred meters. Yeah? So you remember when you have a square root of 1 plus z, if z is very, very, very small, yeah? this is about equal to 1 plus z divided by 2. Yeah? So just continue, so I may write that this is equal to z prime. So I develop in, in a Taylor series, yeah, this at the first order. And I find here that it will be 1 plus x prime square plus y prime square divided by z prime square. And then minus that, yeah, or divided by 2. And then minus 1, then minus x minus x prime square minus y minus y prime square all of this divided by 2z square so I see that the 1 and minus 1 goes away now the x prime here so this is x prime square will go away with that x prime square, yeah? The y prime square will go away with that y, y prime square. So this goes away. And what remains is simply, I would say minus, yeah, a minus. It's x prime. So first, x square plus y square, like that, okay? Uh, the square. Yeah, here is a minus. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. And then uh, plus. Minus, then I, I would uh, say minus. Minus. Two. Two times uh, x, x prime, x prime minus two, two y, y prime, two. like that. And I have to divide everything by two z prime. Yes. So finally, it comes that it's equal to minus x square plus y square divided by 2z prime and now plus x x prime divided by z prime plus y y prime divided by z prime okay uh, you forgot the square for the z prime yeah, no because it goes away with those no for the z prime you forgot the, the yeah, but yes, 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 yes. You forgot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, well, let's still have a look here. Okay, we, we almost got the right answer. Yeah. Okay. Now, I would like to draw your attention on uh, what what represents x prime divided by z, z prime and what represents 
y prime divided by z prime, yeah? So, well, x prime, yeah? <coughs> Along the, the x-axis is such a distance divided by that distance, yeah? So, it, it is the tangent of an angle, yeah? And because the uh, angle is so small, yeah, we may take it as being the angle expressed in radians, yeah? And we call it zeta, okay? Yeah, zeta. And the other one, we call it eta. So I'll try to reduce that, that data. So we, we find that uh, R2 minus R1, yeah? It's about equal to minus x squared plus y squared divided by 2 to the z prime plus Okay, now we, we had x, x prime divided by z prime, and so it's plus x zeta, and then it's plus y eta, like that. Now, I, I should like to rewrite yeah, that formula with the new variables, yeah? So I may write that gamma 1, 2, 0 is equal to double integration. Now ds, yeah? Do you agree that ds is simply dx prime times dy prime? Yeah? Because you are integrating yeah, on the plane of the sky. Now we divide by r1 and r2. What, what is r1 and r2? Do you agree that r1 and r2 is a distance, z prime, yeah? between the observer and the source element. So here I may divide by z prime. So everything that is taken into account, yeah, I just circ circle it here. Yeah. So this is okay. This is okay. Oh, but dx prime divided by z prime, yeah? Do you agree that we had, uh, we have defined zeta as being x prime divided by z prime? So d zeta is equal to dx prime divided by z prime. And similarly, yeah, eta is equal to y prime divided by z prime, which means that d eta is equal to dy prime divided by z prime. So I may replace this quantity here by d theta d eta. Now I, do you agree I, I should integrate it over the, all, all the surface of the source? It means that I just integrate it over yeah, the angular coordinates zeta and eta. Now here I just write exponential minus 1, 2 pi. Multiply by this, yeah? So here, first, I'm taking this into account. So I say, okay, it is uh, x times zeta over lambda plus y over lambda times eta, like that. And after I still have this to be taken into account, and this I take it away of the double integral because it doesn't depend on uh, x prime or y prime, neither on zeta or eta. Yeah, so the exponentiation of plus i two pi multiplied by x square plus y square divided by two z prime. Okay. Okay, now I still have to divide everything by i. Well, what is i? Well, in fact, i is simply the integration over the whole surface yeah, of this intensity. Yeah?
And now if you look at the expression here, yeah? well, we are integrating over zeta eta, zeta eta, zeta eta, and here we, we see x over lambda, y over lambda. It means that this quantity yeah, just depends on two parameters, which is x over lambda and y over lambda. So I may write here that gamma 1, 2 for tau equals 0, which also depends on x over lambda and y over lambda, is equal to that. Now in this expression here, yeah, what you see minus i times phi xy yeah, is simply these terms, yeah, which appears here, like that. And now if I take yeah, the module yeah, of that quantity, what I would obtain? Well, I would obtain that the module yeah, here of that is equal to the module of that, and this is just equal to, to 1. Yeah? Okay, but before doing that, yeah, we shall make some more simplification on the slides. You see that here I have uh, the ratio between uh, this specific intensity and the integration of this specific intensity over the whole surface. Yeah? So I shall define this as being, uh, so you see, I, I take the ratio of the two, and I define this as being the normalized specific intensity of the source. Yeah? Why normalized? It's because if I integrate this quantity over the whole sky, I find that it's equal to one. Yeah? So it's a specific intensity normalized. Okay, now I may rewrite the expressions of the complex degree. Okay, now th this is a one more uh, one more definition. Well, you may call u x over lambda and v y over lambda. If you do that, you see that in this expression where we have here uh, x over lambda, y over lambda, yeah? x over lambda, y over lambda. So here I, I, I could uh, have replaced yeah, this quantity x over lambda yeah, by u, y over lambda by v, put here u, and put it here v. Because very often yeah, people speak in, in terms of the uv space, the uv plane. Yeah? Okay, now, what becomes the expression yeah, of the complex degree of mutual covariance? It comes this, that gamma 1, 2 is equal to, okay, this one, this is easy, times double integration of the normalized specific intensity of the source times this factor. Yeah. Now, when you look just at the double in integral, yeah, the, the double integral, yeah, what does it remind you? Yeah? Does it remind you something? This. Let's assume that we have a function yeah, which depends on the time variable. Yeah? And if I define the Fourier transform, yeah? so the Fourier transform of the function ft as a function of the variable nu, well, I find that this is equal to integration from minus infinity to plus infinity of ft times the complex exponential okay this is the definition of a Fourier transform here yeah? so it's integration of the function times that now if you look at this yeah yeah it's a double Fourier transform, yeah, over the plane of the sky, of this function, yeah, and where the variable instead of being mu, yeah, where the variable will be u and v, yeah. So it's a double Fourier transform, yeah. And th this is a kind of magical, you know. So when you observe a source, yeah, with your interferometer, you see fringes, yeah. Now, if it's a point like, like this in this case, yeah, you are far away, 
you are seeing, you know, the fringes dark, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, yeah? It's okay. Now, a nice experiment to make during the break, yeah? Will be to take a source of light well, with a finite size. This is better, yeah, you see? And we, we, we may put it in the corridor. And if you take your interferometer, and if you go far away, you will see the fringes. Now, if you come closer, well, the fringes will disappear because you will start resolving the source, yeah? Okay? Uh, I don't know why I'm telling you that, but <laughs> just, just to say, okay, well, it, it's sort of magical that the contrast of the fringes, yeah, is related, yeah, to the Fourier transform, yeah, of the distribution of the specific intensity that is normalized, yeah, over the source, yeah? It means that this quantity, uh, the visibility of the fringes that you will see, contains very interesting information about the source, source structure. Yeah? And what is very nice is that, you know, well, if we get this, yeah? if we would like to get that one, well, we just have to make an inverse Fourier transform. Yeah? Because, well, if we have this, yeah? and I call this big F of new, I know that the function of t may be obtained by taking the inverse Fourier transform yeah, of its Fourier transform. So it means I integrate here from minus to plus infinity of F nu. So taking the inverse Fourier transform means that I do this and I integrate on you. So you see, if you know that, you may retrieve this by taking an inverse Fourier transform. So it means that, that if you observe you have a very distant source yeah, with an interferometer, so remember that u and v is equal to x over lambda, v y over lambda, so you try to make many measurements while separating yeah, your two holes or your two elements. You take them in a different direction and you try to cover the UV plane. Yeah? So you take many different X and Y. Yeah? So you get a lot of information here. You take an inverse Fourier transform and you may retrieve this quantity with an angular re resolution yeah, which is given by the inverse of u and the inverse of v, which means since u is equal to x over lambda, so it will be lambda over x and lambda over y. It means that you will recover angular resolution equivalent to that given yeah, by a single telescope, yeah, which dimension, yeah, is of the order of x, so it means a baseline, or the other baseline, depending on which direction you are looking at. Yeah. But we'll, we'll make some application in a moment so that everything will become less abstract. Yeah? So just to continue here, <coughs> you see that I may retrieve this quantity by taking the inverse Fourier transform, yeah? of something which involves those measurements, yeah? So the contrast of the fringes. Fourier transform of a function, yeah? Well, it depends, the Fourier transform depends on the parameter s, yeah? Now the function, well, depends on another variable, which is x, yeah? And this is the definition of the Fourier transform. So you see that the parameter s appears here, and you are integrating on x variable, yeah? Now the inverse Fourier transform, yeah, well, may just be retrieved by taking, yeah, this is the inverse Fourier transform. So you, you, you see that from the knowledge of this one, you may retrieve the second one and vice versa. And well, these Fourier transforms exist as long as uh, this integration yeah, is defined, yeah, okay? Okay, now if we work, yeah, not in a space with a single dimension, but multiple dimensions, 
then we, we, we define the Fourier transform which depends on this vector composed yeah, of n variables and then we define the function on space with the same dimension and what appears here yeah, is just a scalar product of the two vectors now some uh, reminders yeah, linearity yeah. if uh, a is a real constant the Fourier transform yeah, of a times a function well is simply a times the Fourier transform of the function and this you may demonstrate easily yeah, if you forgot yeah. now the Fourier transform of the sum of two functions well is just the sum of the two Fourier transform yeah. so this is very easy to demonstrate <coughs> Now, well, if a function yeah, can be represented yeah, as a big composed of a pair and, well, I would say even and odd parts, yeah? so it means that p of minus x is equal to p of x rather than i of minus x is equal to minus i of x. Yeah? So this is even, even function and odd function. Well, you, you may demonstrate that the free transform of that function, yeah? Well, it's a complex uh, <coughs> function which takes uh, the form yeah, given here. Now, well, this you may demonstrate easily, yeah? Which means that, for instance, yeah, if I ask you the following, I have a function, yeah, which is uh, real and it is an even function, even function, yeah? How will be the free transform? The sum of cosines. What? Uh, if it's a new, uh, yeah. it will be a sum of uh, cosines. Uh, yeah, so it means that, well, the, if it uh, is. The free transform will become. Uh, oh, uh, uh, no. The Fourier transform will become a sum of uh, sides. Uh, no. Look. If the function, if the function is even, yeah. Yes, the function is the sum of cosines. Well, look. If the function is even, it means that the odd part doesn't exist. So it means that this doesn't exist, yes. yeah. So this will remain, yes. and we see that well, it just involves cosines, yes. and because the cosines of uh, two. 2 pi xs or minus 2 pi xs yeah, is an even function. Yeah? So it will also be an even function of s. Yeah. Okay? So you, you, you may play with that. Yeah? I don't want to demonstrate that one now because we, don't, we won't make use of it <coughs> later. Yeah? But uh, we'll make some other demonstration. Yeah? For instance, this is a similitude yeah? property of the Fourier transform. Yeah? And uh, maybe I will put some more light. Yeah. And just make the demonstration here. Yeah? So the Fourier transform yeah, of the function x over a Is equal to what? Yeah. So now I just make the demonstration. Yeah? So I integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity of the function x over a time exponential minus two pi x s dx. You agree with that? This is the definition yeah, of the Fourier transform of that function. Yeah. Now we make a change of variable. Yeah. Okay. Let's suppose y equal x over a. So we have dx is equal to a times dy. Then we find that this is equal to integration. OK, let's assume that a is positive. Yeah? So it will go also from minus infinity to plus infinity, f of y time exponentiation yeah, of minus 2 pi so x is equal to y times a like this now dx so dx it's dy times a and here I find that this is merely the constant a 
times this. In this, you see, it is a Fourier transform. This is a Fourier transform of the function fx, but evaluated, yeah, for, wait a moment, I forgot something. Yes. I just forgot a s here, yeah. Evalu evaluated, yeah, for the variable a times s. And so you see here, <coughs> it is the result. Now, if we make yeah, the same, but taking a constant which is negative here, yeah, you find that there will be a minus sign before, and therefore, <coughs> one should take the modulus here of, of A. So this is an important relation that we shall be using. So the <coughs> Fourier transform, or transform Fourier, of the function x over A, is equal to module A times the Fourier transform of the function of x evaluated for A type S. Well, this also we shall make use of very often. So it's a translation property, yeah? Is that if you translate the function, yeah, in the, from the original plane, well, in the transform plane, yeah, you will have a rotation. So let's make it here. So free transform here yeah, of the function x minus a, which depends on s, is equal, yeah, by definition, yeah, to the integration from minus infinity to plus infinity of the function x minus a times Okay, so this is the definition. Now let's suppose, uh, let's make a change of variable, y equal x minus a. So dy equal dx. And we find that it's equal to integration from minus infinity to plus infinity of the function fy time exponentiation of minus 2 phi. So x is equal to y plus a. So here I will just write y times s. dx is dy. And then I have still to multiply this by exponentiation of minus 2 phi s a. So I find finally that this is equal to the complex exponentiation of minus 2 pi s a multiplied by this is the free transform of the function f yeah? evaluated as a variable s so we shall make very often use yeah, in the future yeah, of this property therefore I demonstrate it here yeah? Well, this is a derivation. I'm never using it, yeah, so I just pass it. But it's easy to demonstrate. This one, we shall make a very intensive use yeah, of that property. So this is a door function. Yeah? So the door function is such that for any value of x yeah, in modulus well, bigger than 1 half, yeah, it's equal to 0. And between uh, minus one half and plus one half, it's equal to one. Yeah? <coughs> so this is the door function. So let's evaluate yeah, what is the Fourier transform yeah, of that door function. So normally, actually, integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity. But because it is equal to zero for any value of modulo x greater than one half, so I just integrate here from minus one half to plus one half. Now the value of the function between those two values is one, so just one. Now time exponentiation of minus two p x s dx. So here I make the change of variable y equal minus i 2 pi 
xs. So we have dy equal minus i2 pi s dx. And this comes. So when I have minus one half here, yeah, I have here minus i pi s. Here i pi s. Then we have here exponentiation of y. And dx is dy divided by i2 pi s with a minus sign here. Yeah? So this is simply equal to 1 over i2 pi s multiplied by, for the function, so if I place the sign minus, oh, here it should be plus and here minus. And because I have minus y here. So because I have minus here, I, have, I may revert here yeah, the order of the integrations. And then I obtain here that it will be exponentiation of y pi s minus exponentiation of minus i pi s, like this. Now, <coughs> Well, this may be rewritten yeah, as a summation of a cosine plus i sine. Yeah? You agree? So this is, uh, I make, when I make the difference, I will find that it is more equal to 2i times the sine of i times s. And when I make the division, I find finally that this is equal to the sine of pi s divided by pi s. And this is a well-known cardinal sine function. So it's a cardinal sine function of s. Yeah? Which definition is that one? So you see it here. Yeah? Well, in 0, yeah, it's equal to 1. And then it goes to 0 when pi times s is equal to pi. It means when s is equal to plus or minus 1. So we see here when s is equal to plus or minus 1, yeah, the sign, the sink, so the cardinal sign is equal to 0. So this is very important because we will make a very intensive use in the future. And so I just recall this property. The Fourier transform of the door function is equal to Very often, yeah, we will encounter the following. We have to evaluate the Fourier transform yeah, of that function, door function, yeah, but for this variable, this variable divided by the constant. Well, then we make use of that one, yeah? And we find that, well, it's equal to module of A times the Fourier transform of that but evaluate it for a times s, yeah? So it will be sine of pi a s divided by pi a s. Okay, so well, this is an interesting one, yeah? The so following, so you just take here the direct function and the function fx dx. So what is the value of this double integration? Do you know? Yeah. Uh, the direct function is defined only at 0. Yeah. So the value of x uh, evaluated in 0. OK. So it's, this is equal to f of 0. We agree, huh? Yeah, very good. <laughs> Which means that now, if I take the following, yeah? I make integration of the direct function. I take the Fourier transform, OK? So 
So you agree, yeah? this is the Fourier transform of the direct function, yeah? So how much is it? Yeah, it's equal to one, yeah? Because when you take the value of this function for x equals zero, so it's one. So this is equal to one. Okay, now we have a way yeah, to define the direct function as the inverse Fourier transform of one. Yeah, you agree? So we may write yeah, that the Fourier, where well, the direct function is equal to the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform of the direct function. Yeah. Okay, this is simple. So let's take the inverse Fourier transform of the one. So we find that it's equal to minus infinity to plus infinity of one times you agree? Uh, no. You see here I integrate yeah, on the hex variable of course, yeah, because the function depends on x and x here is here the parameter. So you see, this is a very nice definition yeah, of the Dirac function in terms of Fourier transform. It's a very important result. Okay, now I shall propose a, an e well, exercise, yeah, number one, and after I shall ask a student yeah, to come to make the second exercise, yeah? So the first exercise is the following. Instead of uh, working yeah, in a two-dimensional space, well, let's assume that we are human bodies living in a one-dimensional space. It's more simple, yeah, technically speaking. And we are observing, yeah, in the sky, a star, which is just one dimension. Okay, the dimension of the star, linear dimension, is small b. Okay, small b. And we are a very distant observer here. So we are here. Looking at that star. Okay. Which is located here. Yeah? At the distance z prime, as before, yeah, just as before. So you see the projection yeah, of the star yeah, on the plane of the sky. And I'm observing it yeah, with a small interferometer here, composed of two holes. And the baseline between the two holes is B. Well, now to proceed, yeah, I, I would like to, to remind you yeah, here what was the expressions of gamma 1, 2. So I would say here B over lambda because now B is a baseline, yeah? And we saw that it was equal to, now it's a one dimension problem, yeah? The integration of the distribution of the normalized intensity of the source, which now only depends on one angular scale, yeah, which is zeta, times exponentiation of minus i2 pi times zeta b over lambda d zeta, and that's all. So this is the de definition yeah, of uh, the complex degree of mutual coherence. And you remember that the visibility of the fringes yeah, is equal to the modulus yeah, of that quantity. So now I, I'm wondering, well, I'm observing yeah, such a simple star for which I assume that the surface brightness is a constant. Yeah, so it's a, uniform star, yeah, uniformly 
illuminate, well, it's brightening in a uniform way. And I'm wondering, well, if I would observe it with a, such an interferometer, I would see fringes, of course, yeah? But what would be the contrast of the fringes, yeah? What would be the visibility, yeah? And this is a problem. Well, I know I just have to solve the first integral there, yeah, to, to find the answer to the problem. Okay, first thing you need, yeah, you see it's I prime, the normalized intensity of the star, yeah? Okay, so uh, normalized intensity of the star, yeah? Yes? Quasi monochromatic. So I assume, yeah, that the star well, is quasi monochromatic, quasi monochromatic, because <coughs> this expression that we derived, yeah, is for quasi monochromatic light, yeah. So for very narrow band pass, yeah. So would you agree that I would say, okay, well, the intensity of the star, yeah, probably can be represented as a function, as the following, I could say, well. It's a kind of door function, yeah? It's like a door function. It's zero, here it's zero, here it's a constant, and then it is zero again, yeah? So you could say, well, okay, it's like a door function, which depends on zeta. So what is zeta? Well, it is the angle measure, yeah? With respect to with an origin, yeah, so zeta, but I should divide this, yeah, by what? I would say by b over v prime. And now I say, well, time a constant, which I should define. So let's try to see if this is correct or not, yeah? So I know that the door function is equal to 1 whenever zeta over b over z prime is smaller than one half or bigger than one half. Yeah. It means that the b over z prime, I put it here, and here b over z prime. Yeah? So here it's minus. Huh? So do, do we agree with that? It's correct, yeah? Whenever yeah, zeta will be smaller than b over half, this is one half divided by this distance. So whenever the angle will be smaller than that, it's one. But whenever it's greater than minus yeah, the same value, it should be also one. So do we agree that this is a good way of representing the distribution of the surface brightness of the star? Yeah? It's a door function, yeah? Here it's zero, here it's a constant, and there it's zero. Now I should find the value of the constant so that I could say, okay, this is the normalized distribution intensity, okay? So this is what I'm going to do next. How to find the value of the constant? Well, I know that if I integrate I prime of zeta d zeta between minus infinity and plus infinity, it should be equal to one. Yeah, this is the definition of the normalized intensity. So it means that when I integrate, so this thing, so it means, so if I divide by b z prime, it's as if I would multiply by z prime divided by b here, d z prime times the constant is equal to one. Yeah. So I find that the constant is equal to one divided by this quantity, yeah, which is which is the integral. Okay, well, the integral, do you agree that I should integrate it yeah, between uh, minus b over 2z prime and 
plus b over 2z prime. Yeah? Because this is a, a door function here. Yeah? So it's for z between minus b over 2z prime to b over 2z prime. Now the value of the function there is 1, so I just leave 1. So this is equal to 1 over, oh, but this is very easy to, in to integrate, yeah, because b over 2z prime minus minus b over 2z prime, it's simply equal to b over z prime, yeah. So this is simply b over z prime, so it's z prime over b. So I find that the constant here is simply z prime over b. Okay, now I continue here. Now I go there, I say okay, the complex degree of mutual coherence. is equal to that integration, so the integration of i prime, z prime over b, is a constant, yeah? So it's z prime over b times the door function of zeta prime, b over z prime, like that, times the exponentiation of minus i2 pi zeta big B over lambda d z. Okay? And here I go from minus infinity to plus infinity. So we find that it's equal to z prime over b. Now, I may reduce, yeah? So interval of integration to minus b over 2z prime up to b over 2z prime and then it remains this quantity we agree with that Now I make a change of variable, yeah? So I define a variable y as being this one, yeah? Minus i to pi times zeta times b over lambda. And I'm getting here that dy is equal to minus i to pi times b over lambda times d zeta. So we find that this is equal to z prime over b Now let's make uh, this uh, change of variable So here I will go from i well, the 2 and the 2 will disappear. Then there will be a remain a pi, a b, a small b over lambda z prime. So this is what I find. Is it correct? Yeah? So here at the top will be minus i pi big b small b divided by lambda z prime, like this. Now it's time exponentiation yeah, of y and d zeta, d zeta is given here, so it's dy divided by divided by i to pi b over lambda. Correct? 
And of course, I have a minus sign here, which comes here, yeah, in front. So, is there oh, a step which is not clear? Is it okay? Yeah. So we are here. I just continue here, yeah. So we would find if there is no mistake, yeah. So with the minus sign, yeah, you reverse you know, the order of integration, <coughs> and we get that when it's equal to z prime over b, then times lambda over i two pi b, like that, multiplied by the complex exponent of i pi b b over lambda z prime divided minus exponentiation of minus i pi b b over lambda z prime like that which is equal to so as before, yeah, you know, cosine minus cosine, they go away. So they remain two high times the sine. It will be the sine of pi b b over lambda c prime. So the two high will go away, yeah? And then they will remain here be below. Pi BB, Pi BB over lambda Z prime. Okay? Yeah. So this is what we find. Oh, what we find is a cardinal sign, cardinal sign function again, which is not surprising because well, from the beginning yeah, we took the Fourier transform of a door function. Yeah? So is no surprise. And what uh, does it say? So you see the result, yeah, which is found. So here is represented, of course, the visibility of the fringes yeah, is the modulus of that quantity, which is shown here. And so this is a sine cardinal of that function. And what we find, yeah, which is sort of important, yeah, is that X, the X quantity is, uh, is this, of course, yeah? It's P pi BB divided by lambda Z, Z prime. So we see when the baseline B, B big B, yeah, is small, very small, where we are X equals zero, and we see a visibility of one, yeah? So we are looking at that star, yeah, with our interferometer, which is very close, yeah? And we see uh, the fringes, very dark, very, bright, yeah, with a contrast maximum, visibility equal to one, yeah. As we separate the, the two holes, the baseline B increase, and uh, the visibility uh, will drop to zero. And when will it drop to zero? Well, it will drop to zero when this argument here will be equal to pi, yeah, which means that we find that B over Z prime will be equal to lambda over B. Yeah? Okay, now, could, so tell, so could someone tell me what represents physically B over Z prime? Small b over Z prime. Yeah, it is angle under which we see the the one-dimensional stellar source, yeah? Okay? So this is simply the angular diameter, yeah? Of the source. So you see that when you separate, yeah, the two holes, such as that, yeah, the baseline leads, yeah, to a visibility which is null, so you don't see fringes anymore, yeah? You found that the angular diameter of the star you're looking at 
is lambda over the baseline. Yeah? So you find the angular diameter of the source. Yeah? So it's sort of magic, yeah? very nice. Now, even, yeah, well, it may be difficult yeah, to find exactly the separation between the two holes to get uh, visibility equal to zero. Yeah? Let's assume that you, the two holes are not too close together, but they are at a certain distance. Yeah? And you make an observation, for instance, here. Yeah? You measure the visibility. So you have a value for the visibility. Yeah? It's what you're observing. Yeah? You get the fringes, you see visibility. You say, OK, my visibility is maybe 0 0.7. So what you do, you say, oh, 0 0.7 is here. So it corresponds to a given value for that parameter. So you say, OK, that times that divided by that is equal to that value. So you find the angular diameter of the soil with just one measurement. Yeah? But this presupposes that you have a model for it. Yeah? You say, yes, it's because what I'm observing yeah, is a uniformly bright star, yeah? which in, in this case is one dimension. OK, so it shows you just with one measurement, you may get very interesting information about the star. Yeah? So <clears throat> this is what we find yeah, for a rectangular source. Yeah, that the diameter is just equal to lambda over b. Let's assume now, yeah, because it, this is funny, yeah, that the source yeah, is not one dimension, but it's two dimension, just like uh, the solar disk, but seen from a very, very big distance. And you, you use a real interferometer, a real one, yeah, like VLTI. Yeah? What would you find? Yeah? Well, this is the answer. You'd find, and this is very complex mathematics, yeah? that the angular size yeah, would lead to a zero visibility whenever uh, the angular diameter is equal to 1.22 lambda over b. So you see, between the two, there is just a difference, a slight difference in the constant value. Instead of 1, it's 1.22. Because it is circular, and you take yeah, into account yeah, a two-dimensional problem, not a one-dimension. But to get here, yeah, instead of having a cardinal sign, you would find instead that it is a Bessel one-order function. Yeah? First order Bessel function, which is m technically much more complicated. Yeah? But already, if you treat the problem yeah, in one dimension, well, you get a very good answer. And it's so simple, because you, you, you are just dealing with a door function, sine cardinal, rather than if you go two dimension, well, you have to, to deal with a circular disk, with a first order Bessel function, zero order Bessel function. So technically, it's much more complicated. But we will do that also, yeah? Well, in one or two lessons, yeah? So we'll treat that case also. <clears throat>